I think this is a long one, so I might take just keep a couple breaths. So just be prepared. I'm sorry that I have to take such deep breaths. Reading out loud is a lot of work. Um, you know that from me sitting in class, and you need to take a whole lot of breaths. So kind of the same thing. So what you should be getting from Book Both Ways so far is that there are so many different kinds of people, um, not only just in the world, but just in one community. So like I said earlier, this is only a group of kids that attend one middle school who live in um, the same neighborhood. So this is just such a small community, and there's so far just so many different stories. I think, what, I've read five chapters now. And there, they were like five very distinct different stories about five different groups of kids and just there's so many things happening um, in people's like home lives and personal lives and pe things that are pe happening in people's head that we have no idea about that we kind of forget about that the people around us have things going on that we don't always see so just something to keep in mind um, as we keep reading and just in life so you don't always know someone's story so it's best to be as kind and thoughtful and considerate and opening and accepting as you possibly can be no matter what so life lesson over chapter start <laughs> chestnut street five things easier to do than simeon's and kenzie's secret handshake one getting through the crowded hallway after the bell rings Simeon Cross was big for his age. Big, like two kids tall and two kids wide. A walking anvil with a happy, gappy smile that lit every doorway he darkened. Impossible to miss when he was around, and impossible not to miss when he was absent. So when the bell rang, Simeon got up from his desk in Mr. Devanzo's class, grabbed his backpack off the floor, and waited by the door while all his classmates filed out, jumping up to give him high fives. Everybody but Ty Carson, who bolted out of class probably because Mr. Devanzo couldn't stand people asking to go to the bathroom. There's no time for breaks when it comes to understanding the world around you, he said. After everyone else had gone, Simeon walked over to Mr. Devanzo, and they slapped the backs of their hands together, knuckles knocking like tiny pool balls. There he was, secret handshake, which was nothing, elementary compared to the complex system he and Kenzie had. Kenzie Thompson was small for his age, tied for the smallest kid in his class with another boy everybody called Vic. Kenzie didn't have a nickname like that, and if anyone ever tried to give him one, he would do nothing. Well, that's not true. He would do something, but that something would be telling Simeon, and then Simeon would do nothing, because when you're Simeon size, a look is more than enough. Kenzie's name, though, only five letters, was longer than he was. But other than his smallness and the fact that he carried a blue bouncy ball everywhere he went, there was really nothing else about him that stood out. He wasn't particularly tough or loud or funny or sad or weird or even smelly. Just Kenzie. Maybe he'd speak in class, maybe he wouldn't. Got good grades when he studied, bad grades when he didn't. Wasn't dripping in name brands, but always clean. And was friends with everyone, but really friends with no one. But Simeon, and Simeon was friends with everyone. Because being his enemy just wasn't smart. Kenzie walked the middle of every line. Until the bell rang, and then something else. Kenzie never rushed, rushed out of Mr. Fantana's class like the rest of the students. Not because he had some kind of special love for life science, I mean, it was okay, but because he knew he'd never make it to his locker with the hundreds of other kids traffic jamming and bumper carring around, not paying attention to the fact that their elbows were right by his face. He'd been hit before, several times, had his eyes swollen accidentally by girls who swung their arms around to make sure their friends understood the importance of whatever they were saying. Had his lip busted because some boy was pretending it was five seconds left in the fourth quarter. Curry with the ball, he shoots, he scores, and he punches a kid in the face while hitting his crossover. That kid, Kenzie. For him, the hallway was a minefield, and there were hundreds of active minds dressed in t-shirts and jeans. So he waited while Mr. Fantana gathered his lesson plans, put the tops back on his dry erase markers, waited and waited for... Yo, Simeon came bursting into Mr. Fantana's room. Fantana banana, what's good, what's hood, what's new, what's true? Simeon gave Mr. Fantana an awkward handshake that looked like Mr. Fantana was trying to figure out how hands work. Took you forever, bro, Kenzie said, getting up from his desk. My bad, man, Simeon said, reaching out for Kenzie's hand. Don't, Mr. Fantana sparked up, don't, don't do that handshake in here. Not because I think anything is wrong with it. It's just, I really want to get going, guys. And that handshake y'all do takes way too long. 
I know you probably won't believe this, but teachers have lives too, Mr. Fantana smirked, then went on shoving papers into his leather bag. Wow, Mr. Fantana, I thought you were all about life science. What we were getting ready to show you how was life science in full effect. Simeon explained, I am, and I love y'all, but not today. Then he pointed at the door, please. Simeon didn't argue. He just turned back to Kenzie. Come on, Kenzie. I don't want to be nowhere. We ain't welcome. Simeon cut it. Mr. Fantana started, but Simeon shut him down. Nope, nope. You said what you said, and the damage is done. Simeon bent his knees, squatting just enough for Kenzie to get a running start, to jump onto his back. And off they went, out into the busy hallway of stumbling awkward bodies, pinballing around, bouncing into one another and off lockers. Simeon, bigger than the rest, was unbounceable. He couldn't be knocked down or pushed out of the way. Ready? Simeon asked Kenzie over his shoulder. Kenzie had his arms wrapped around Simeon's neck. Tight enough, tight, uh, tight enough to hold on to, but not tight enough to choke him. Let's do it, Kenzie called back, and off they went. Two, getting out of trouble with Miss Walkley for pretending to be in a horse race. But, Miss Walkley, we're not pretending to be in a horse race, Simeon pleaded. Miss Walkley stood at the door to the school, her face a pink raisin, made raisiny, raisinier when she was in discipline mode, which was all the time. It was pretty much her job to tell everyone what not to do. Stop making fart noises, stop dancing, stop dancing like that, stop rapping, stop singing, stop laughing, stop acting like children, children. Mr. Cross, Mr. Thompson, was just on your back yelling yee-haw while circling his arms in the air as if winding an imaginary lasso. Miss Walkley demonstrated, and it took everything in both boys not to crack up. That's just how he talks, Simeon said. I'm going to say this to you for the thousandth time, Miss Walkley seemed. All feet should be and stay firmly on the ground. But what about Pia Foster? Her feet be on a skateboard. This from Kenzie. It wasn't snitching because everybody knew Pia skated through school. The one time anyone had seen Simeon hurt was when Pia skated over his foot. And I told her not to do that, but we're not talking about Miss Foster, are we? No, we're talking about you two. Miss Walkley folded her arms. I've given you so many warnings and you don't seem to take me seriously. So wait, 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 before you write us up, I think it's important that we at least let you know why we do it. Miss Walkley sighed. She would heard their excuse, different versions of it, time and time again, but they were always so entertaining that she was game to hear it once more. See, here's the thing, Walkley Broccoli. Can I call you that? Simeon asked. No. Got it. Here's the thing. Kenzie here got a big heart, but that big heart happens to be in a small body. Now, I don't know about you, but I would hate for that heart to be broken because that body was knocked around. That would be a tragedy. Travesty, Kenzie corrected. Travesty, Simeon repeated, and so, because I love Kenzie, I protect him. I make sure he can maneuver down these busy hallways without worrying about anything. I'm basically his bodyguard. Tell me something, Mr. Cross. How exactly does Mr. Thompson get from class to class during the day when he's not with you? Simeon knew this was a setup. I know where you're going with this, and I don't know, because I'm not with him, Miss Walkley, but I can only imagine how scary it must be. Simeon put his arm around Kenzie. Kenzie turned his face into a puppy's. Is this true, Mr. Thompson, that the hallways are scary for you? Oh, Miss Walkley, you got no idea. Just the other day, Joey Santiago didn't see me standing behind him, and he just backed me into a locker, like backed him all the way into it, as in his whole body was in. I understand what he's saying, Mr. Cross. He has a mouth. Exactly. He does have a mouth. Simeon was right there with her. He also has arms and legs, feet and hands. And in the same way you don't want him silenced, you also don't want him to be invisible, do you? Yeah, you don't want me to be invisible, do you, Miss Walkley? Miss Walkley's tight face was still tight, but a little less tight than it was when Kenzie and Simeon had gotten caught, pulled over by her. If I could just make one more point, Miss Walkley. She cut Simeon off. You can't. Please just go home and come back tomorrow ready to follow the rules. Miss Walkley marched off, the sound of her chunky heels clacking loudly. She turned and added, when you two grow up, I really hope you become more than horse and jockey, because people lose a lot of money betting on horse races. Not if they bet on us, Simeon zapped right back at her. Plus, I want to be a lawyer, Kenzie said, trying to control the sting in his throat, because they're smart and they know stuff like, jockeys don't say yee-haw, cowboys do. Three, getting to the neighborhood. Outside was what outside always was, a, sp a spill out of inside. It was like the main hallway was the river that led into the ocean of backpacks, ball caps, and braids. Energy and engines roaring, the roar of school. Energy and engines roaring, the roar of school is finally over. 
Yo, you gotta get old Waka Waka out of here with that cowboy line. Plus, I ain't no horse, I'm a friend. Your brother, Simeon said to Kenzie as they walked up to the corner. Miss Post, the crossing guard, was standing there with her arms out. Hey, boys, she said. Kenzie leaned in for a hug. Hey, Miss Post. That hug happened every day between Kenzie and the crossing guard. A walking ritual. Staying out of trouble, she asked. Of course, Simeon said. Matter of fact, I'm going home to do my homework, because we have homework. Not sure Canton here told you this or not, but there's homework. Canton was Miss Post's son. He was sitting, leaning against the stop sign in the corner, waiting for her, like he did every day. Canton just shook his head, paying the big guy no mind, because everyone was used to him being silly. And what about you, little man, Miss Post added, addressed Kenzie, staying out of the street. Trying, Kenzie followed, holding the blue ball up as if she could look into it and see the day's behavior. What about you, Simeon now asked Miss Post, who put a hand up to signal for walkers to hold on tight to the corner and wait for her whistle. Best I can, she replied, popping the silver twitter into her mouth and stepping back off the curb. Catch you tomorrow, Miss Post, Kenzie said, waving as he and Simeon turned right. Most walkers walk to the left, down Portal Avenue, towards some of the other neighborhoods, but to the right, up Portal Ave, is where Chestnut Homes were, where Simeon and Kenzie live. It took no time, because they were there were very few of their classmates going that way, and the ones who actually lived there didn't walk there. So, the path was clear, laid out for Simeon the Grand and Kenzie the Great, like a runway to their kingdom, a kingdom where carrying a person on your back was allowed, encouraged even. A kingdom where kings are throned and dethroned daily. Where the crown jewels get dropped down sewers and flushed down toilets. A kingdom full of princes like Kenzie and Simeon. Princes no one ever bet on anyway. Anyway, like I was saying, we family. Simeon nailed down what he was going on before they stopped to talk to Miss Post. Exactly. You're my brother, Kenzie confirmed, bouncing the blue ball as they approached Chestnut Street. The way Kenzie and Simeon thought about it, Chestnut Street is a paradise. Light poles are like palm trees, bus stop, benches like hammocks, and corner stores like island bungalows. There's a smell in the air, a mix of exhaust and exhaustion, also cooked food and cooked hair. There's a feeling in the air, a stickiness like walking through an invisible syrup, a thickness to life. There's a sound in the air, a shrill and chill, the scream and whisper of the world making a symphony of so good and so what. Also the sound of Kenzie and Simeon, their voices still young, still sweet like flutes cutting through. Most people tighten up when they walk down Chestnut, tuck tails and tuck chains. But for Kenzo and Simeon, this was there where they could let loose, where they could run and slap the street signs pretending to dunk, where they could stand on the blue mailboxes like pedestals or see who could balance the longest on the tip top of a fire hydrant, where they could open random doors of random shops and speak to the owners, Mrs. Wilson's beauty supply store, tell your mama I got new wigs, or Mr. Chase's hardware store, your daddy get that sink to stop leaking at, or Sue, who owned the Chinese restaurant and was always too busy to speak to them, but nowhere was better than Freddo's. Four, picking the perfect snack from Freddo's corner store. Walking into Freddo's was like walking into a dungeon, no matter what time of day it was. The light was always so dim, and the shelves were packed so high that you couldn't see over them. Walls of whatnot, no windows, big enough for the world's snacks, but too small for anything else. Always smelled like incense smoke trying to mask dirty moth water. Kenzie and Simeon came through the door with the kind of confidence of someone who owned the place. Freddo, Simeon called, throwing up a hand while heading towards bunk cakes and boxes of binny donuts. Well, if it isn't Wrecked Ralph and Tiny Tim, Freddo shot back. He was flipping through the newspaper, licking his fingers every few seconds to turn the pages, as if anyone could read that fast. You know, I look through this paper every day, hoping I don't see y'all faces. You never will, Kenzie said, unless it's for something good. Something good like what, Fredo asked, setting the paper on the counter. Something good like me becoming a big-time lawyer, Kenzie replied. Yeah, or like me becoming a famous actor, Simeon said, so I can act like a big-time lawyer. He picked up a snack cake, turned it over to the check the expiration date. No telling how long Fredo kept things, but they'd bought cakes there that tasted like bricks before. Listen, it's more likely a school bus will fall from the sky. Ouch, Simeon gripped his chest dramatically. Don't get me wrong, I hope all that happens so y'all can buy this store and I can retire, kick back, and watch Law & Order marathons all day, every day. Well, we'd have to change the name of this place, Simeon said, accidentally bumping bags of chips off the shelf behind him to something like K&S Food, or S&K Food, Kenzie suggested. Fredo knitted his fingers together, rested his hands on the counter like some kind of judge. Okay, gentlemen, whatever you say. A few moments later, Kenzie and Simeon were at the counter. A bag of chips for Kenzie and a snack cake for Simeon. A moon pie. 
Fifty cents each, boys, Fredo said. I got you, Simeon said to Kenzie, sliding Kenzie's chips over to be included with his cake. Okay, so that's going to be a dollar, big man. And then came the change. Simeon reached into his pocket and pulled out a fistful of dimes and nickels and pennies, slapped them down on the counter, and started separating them and counting them out as if he were setting a checkers board. Kenzie chuckled. He was used to Simeon doing stuff like this and seeing all that change on the counter. He couldn't help but think about how bit Burns, Kenzie's short twin in school, who had a reputation for patting people's pockets and stealing their change, would never try that on Simeon. Hold on, let me count it out, Simeon said. 5, 10, 15, 16, 17, 27, 28. Hi, your brother, Fredo asked Simeon. He yeah, ain't probably somewhere in the street driving that old ice cream truck around fronting like he legit. Fredo nodded and then nodded at Kenzie. And what about yours? I still you see carrying around that old handball of his everywhere you go. You know he ain't no good at that game, right? And before Kenzie could answer, Simeon got frustrated and slammed his hand on the counter. You made me lose count, man. Simeon boomed. God, now I have to start all over. Five, ten, f Okay, Fredo said, scooping the right amount off the counter and into his palm. We'll be here all day. Where you gotta go, Fredo? Simeon taunted him. To your mother's house. Ask her how many times she dropped you when you were a baby. Oh, no need to ask her that. I can tell you. She only dropped me once. Into a vat of gold. And a vat of gravy, Fredo cracked, but Simeon didn't laugh. Then, because Simeon didn't laugh, Kenzie stepped up. Better chill, Fredo, Kenzie warned. Matter of fact, just for, th just for that. And then, up on his tippy toes, he reached over and grabbed Fredo's newspaper off the counter. And when Fredo didn't budge, Kenzie snatched his lighter, too. This got Fredo's attention. No more cigarettes. They bad for you, anyway. No more of them booty funk incense, either, Simeon said, opening the door, his laughter ling lingering in the store after he and Kenzie left. Such silly things to take, a gossipy newspaper and a lighter, as if Fredo ain't on a store. One with a bunch of newspapers and matches and lighters behind the counter. But still, it was about the principle, the loyalty, the brotherhood. <sighs> Five, making wishes. When Kenzie and Simeon made it to their building, the building they'd been living in their entire lives, they sat out on the front steps. The whole walk home, they laughed about Fredo, making up silly jokes about him. Fredo looked like a puppet, like somebody got their hand up his butt controlling him, Kenzie snapped. He looked like the type of dude who owned the store that just sells snacks. Like, you know, what kind of guy you gotta be to just sell snacks? Snacks from Simeon, who now had the newspaper and rolled it into a tube. He swung it around like a short sword. What did Fredo even mean? I mean, if it's Alfredo, then it, that, that would explain it, because they're definitely cheesy. Kenzie piled on, bouncing his ball back and forth under his legs. A slight breeze blew litter around. Plastic bags, plastic bags floating like jellyfish, and a deflated birthday balloon, one of the shiny metallic ones, lifted and zipped through the air like happy shrapnel. Exactly. Cheesy. But I can't front. He got me with the gravy joke. Simeon followed the balloon with his eyes, as if it were a football thrown long, or a messenger pigeon with a note from afar. A smirk crept onto his face. Yeah, he did, Kenzie agreed. And they both cracked up. Kenzie set the, set the ball down, opened his bag of chips, offered Simeon some. Nah, I'm good, Simeon said as the balloon floated out of view, but give me that lighter. Kenzie handed Simeon Fredo's lighter, unsure of what he was going to do with it. He couldn't grow up to be a lawyer if Simeon was getting ready to set something on fire. Jokes were one thing, but burning stuff down was something totally different. Simeon unrolled the newspaper, glanced at the front page, which was a story about a school bus falling from the sky, and ripped it in half. Then ripped the half in half, and twisted it into a paper worm. At least that's what it looked like. Then he took the moon pie from its plastic, his huge fingers crushing most of it, trying to slide it out perfectly. Happy birthday to you, Simeon started singing in a fake opera voice. Happy birthday to you. What? Happy birthday, dear Kenzie. Happy birthday to you. Simeon stuck the paper worm into the moon pie, making it into a wick. Then he let the end of it on fire. Happy birthday, man. I would have sang, do the black people version, but I didn't want to turn the special moment into a concert, Simeon said, holding the moon pie out for Kenzie. The growing flame flicked the air. It's, uh, not my birthday, bro. Quick, quick, blow it out before it turns the, this moon pie into a s'more. Kenzie gave in, leaned over, and don't forget to make a wish. Kenzie thought for a moment, then huffed the fire out, bits of scorched paper flying off like the black snowflakes, the smoke, smoke corkscrewing up into the air. What do you wish for? Simeon asked. I ain't telling you because then it won't come true. True, Simeon said, standing up. Well, since I can't know your wish, I might as well go get at this homework Mr. Devanzo wants us to write about environmental something. I don't know, but I know I'll get a better view looking out my apartment window. You can see more from up there. Simeon pulled the paper out of the moon pie. He gave, split, 
he split the snack, stuffed half in his mouth, and gave the other half to Kenzie. Yeah, I'm out too, Kenzie said, back on his feet. As well, he shoved his half of the moon pie in his mouth too, slipped the ball in the bag, hand to free, had to free his hand for what was coming. The handshake. They grabbed hands, shake, shake, slide, finger grip, shake, shake. Then point to themselves, double fist bump, throw a peace sign beside each of their right ears, point to each other, slap their individual fingertips together, rub the ears as if they were holding a ball, bigger than the one in Kenzie's bag. Then they thumb their chins and shake their heads at each other before ending it with a big hug. If you try that with someone in your house, please let me know how it goes. Brothers, Simeon said. Brothers, Kenzie repeated. His voice muffled by the moon pie he was still chewing. They did it just like they'd watched their older brothers do it. The same shake, the same secret, the same bond on the same steps. And as they rode the elevator up to their separate floors, Simeon on seven, Kenzie on nine, Simeon looked at Kenzie, knowing what he wished for. And Kenzie looked at Simeon, knowing Simeon knew that he wished the smoke from the paper candle could drift, carry a note through the air across the city and state, over lands and highways he'd never been on, through barbed wire, stone and iron, ghosting its way through the bars and into the ear of his brother, to tell him how he wished he didn't have to walk home from school. How he wished his brother Mason could pick him up in a car just like the car Simeon's brother Chucky had stolen almost two years ago. The one Mason took the hit for, went down for, but not that one, a different one, and took Kenzie for a ride, maybe even showed him how to play.